service. Would you take your hymnals? Turn to 278. Let's stand together and we'll sing. 278 at Calvary. this week, the third, fourth, and the fifth, and uh, a number of teens and a bunch of adult leaders have been working on that all summer long, and uh, we're getting really close to being perfect, and the day of Wednesday, we, we trust the Lord that everything will come together and it will be uh, a great week. Uh, that's from 6 uh, p.m. to 8 p.m., uh, so I'll be mentioning to people I think if you uh, follow us on Facebook, you can share the, the VBS and things like that uh, to your Facebook page and, and do things like that. But if you know a, a young uh, person in elementary 
and uh, you, you can let them know uh, six to eight uh, from the third, the fourth, and the fifth. So it looks really exciting. Uh, when we uh, decided we were going to do it this year that way, I it was my job to pick out some curriculum. So I read some curriculums, and I really like that. I think that's something our world needs is to teach everyone and remind everyone that we are created in the image of God and that life has value. So I'm excited uh, for the, the young people to learn that and, and go over that. Also, uh, one other announcement here is immediately following this, I actually have two more announcements, but immediately following this sermon uh, service, we are having a luncheon because today is the fifth Sunday. So uh, when, when we have five Sundays in a month, we don't have an evening service, but we have a luncheon. And today the theme is hamburgers and hot dogs. So a couple of the fellows are out there doing some grilling. And, and uh, even if you forgot about it or, or didn't bring something, I, I think we should have plenty of food. And uh, so you are definitely welcome to stay. And then the next two Sundays, uh, during Sunday school, which starts at 945, uh, we are having the case for Christ. So the students, the high school and junior high students all summer long have been reviewing through the life of Jesus. And we're going to uh, sort of put Jesus on trial in, in a sense. Uh, so it's, it's going to be uh, proving that Jesus is alive, that he came back from the dead. And so our job as the adult Sunday school class was to come up with some opposing points of view and and they're going to call witnesses and we're going to call witnesses and we have a judge and a jury and everything like that so even if you don't normally come to Sunday school I'd encourage you to come uh, for the next two weeks uh, during Sunday morning because that room's going to be turned into a courtroom uh, so uh, definitely come to that even if you can't get here till about 10 uh, we should be definitely started, and you can you can join us there. So, uh, grab make sure you grab a bulletin and uh, look at the different things going on there. I think Camp Michael, some things got switched around. My daughter's week earlier in the year got canceled, and she's going to be this week. So, uh, but still keep praying for Camp Michael. I, I know uh, the high schoolers were last week, and I heard it was a really good time. So, uh, we're just thankful for their ministry as well. A couple prayer requests I did want to mention. Uh, Carrie isn't feeling well. She's not here today. Noelle's not feeling well. She's not here today as well. Uh, but we heard about an accident uh, out uh, over by Grand Rapids. A number of people from North Branch were riding bikes, bicycles in a Mako, a Wish uh, Foundation charity. And there was about 300 riders from all over the state. And uh, Teresa was out there helping and, and a car hit the pack somewhere and injured a bunch and there was a couple of fatalities so those families I'm, I'm sure could use our prayer we don't have details we don't know names I don't think it's anybody from North Branch that was uh, hurt or, or killed but uh, definitely be praying for those folks as, as when you think about them that's a, definitely a bad situation but um, we're also privileged this morning here in a few minutes we're going to hear from uh, one of our missionaries Dallas Putnam so let's go to the Lord in prayer uh, Father God, we are uh, very thankful for uh, your kindness, and it's it's a kindness that we don't understand that we have a difficult time really grasping because we talk about kindness in human terms, but your kindness is a, a loving kindness, a graciousness that uh, really surpasses all understanding, and, and we're thankful that uh, you are so loving and kind to us every day even at moments and times when we don't deserve it, even those times when uh, we are uh, doing things contrary to your will and your way. Uh, Father God, we think of these prayer requests that have been mentioned. We think of this just tragedy out there uh, with those bike riders. And we, we think of those families this morning as they're grieving the loss of their loved ones and those that potentially still in the hospital fighting uh, for their lives. We pray uh, that... Uh, grace would be given to those people and most importantly that the, the gospel would sort of be, be intertwined in these conversations with these bike riders. I pray for Teresa that she would have opportunities to, to talk about Jesus when she's out there. Lord we think of Carrie and Noel and some others that I don't see here this morning that 
aren't feeling so great, so we just pray for them, give them strength. Uh, Lord, we especially lift up our, our VBS that's going to be this week, and we're just thankful for all those that have been working so hard to prepare it. And so, Lord, we just pray that a lot of uh, children come out and uh, hear the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and Lord, uh, we think of uh, Dallas and CBM and, and all the things they have going on there with the transition and shuffling around in ministry and the different duties that he's doing. Lord, just give his, his, him wisdom as he does a lot more of the day-to-day -day, uh, operation at the, the ministry. So we're just thankful for him. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's say it again and turn to 394, My Desire, for us to sing together.
take your Bibles, turn to John chapter 13 for the Bible reading. John 13 and verse 31. Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, Whether I go, ye cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, and that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have loved one to another. You can be seated, and the gentlemen come forward for the offering. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, just thank you for the time that we could gather in your house today to, to worship you and to learn from your word. Pray that you'd be with this week as we're uh, having VBS here at the church, that you would just bless that, and that if there's any of the children that don't know you, that they'll come to know you this week, and that you would help us to present the gospel clearly. And I pray that you would just be with um, the trials that we're going to have in Sunday school the next couple weeks, that you would help us to learn more about your word and more about um, Jesus and that we'll be able to defend him to the world. Just bless the service today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn to 703. Nothing is Actually, it's Dallas. I'm sorry. <laughs> you sit down again. That's all right. We were just joking. I'm a phys ed teacher by trade, so I just like that up and down stuff. <laughs> uh, when we have missionaries, usually they come out and they share during Sunday school, give a, a few minutes update in the morning so everybody can get to meet them a little bit, and then they take the whole Sunday night. Uh, but we don't we don't have Sunday night tonight, so uh, we're going to give uh, Dallas an opportunity to come up here and share, and and I think it'll be a good opportunity because it's a much bigger crowd here on Sunday morning, and you can hear about his ministry. So why don't you come on up, Dallas? 
As I mentioned in Sunday school, it is a blessing to be back with you, and uh, it's good to see uh, new faces, and it's good to see familiar faces. I'm careful with that last statement because several of us are 30-plus uh, years older than we were before when I was here the first time, and so uh, it, is a, it is a blessing to be back with you. Uh, for those of you that may not be aware, we're involved with the, mainly the building ministries of Continental Baptist Mission, physically helping uh, church plants and revitalization churches and other small churches that can't afford to have a contractor help them with a needed facility, uh, help with that. Uh, we started out with the hands-on part of construction after raising our support. Our last six years out on the road, I pulled the 38-foot straight trailer that we lived in 15 years full-time. And Nancy pulled a 32-foot trailer that was my office trailer. And, uh, and then now I've been directing the building ministry for the last several years. And then recently, along with Director of Building Ministries, I'm now also uh, Director of the Finances, overseeing the uh, finances there at the home office uh, also. And so we'd really appreciate your prayers. I'm just going to take a, a minute to put something together that we're uh, actually, where it's going to be out and uh, published to go to some churches here in the near future. But uh, there's there's question, uh, you know, it's about who does who does missions. And as director of building ministry, what what is your role? Is you know what are you what are you doing in missions? Well, uh, we're helping as director of building ministries first in line with meeting with the churches and helping them get into the facilities. But as director of the financing is also helping the missionaries that are out on the field on the front lines and assisting the churches that are supporting them, assisting the Sunday churches, make sure that the funds that come in for each of our missionaries gets uh, posted in the right place and then that it gets distributed to the right the missionaries to keep them doing the frontline work uh, work out in the field. So I'll, I'll just read through this uh, quickly. It's not real long, but uh, who does the work of missions? Certainly frontline servants like Paul and Titus, whose days were often filled with face-to-face -face encounters with the lost. We understand their ministries also represented the churches that sent them and the churches that supported them. Less obvious, however, were the workers with obscure yet vital roles. Take Tychicus, for example. In his letter to Ephesus and his letter to Colossae, Paul wrote of Tychicus, I have sent him to you for this very purpose that you may know how we are. How we are. Communicating ministry news was important enough to engage the service of Tychicus and stand the expense of his travel from Rome to Asia Minor. It's worth noting that the man who served in this role is described as a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. In the overall work of the gospel, what Tychicus was, what Tychicus was, it's hard to say that Tychicus, but Tychicus was, and what he did really mattered. And uh, so who does, the, who does the work of missions today within the sphere of CBM? Certainly the 28 missionaries, which that includes Nancy and I, and, uh, and others, 28 missionaries who are actively planting, revitalizing, building churches. Certainly the 26 churches that have sent out CBM missionaries. Certainly the 381 churches and 336 individuals that financially support CBM missionaries. And yes, the six individuals who make up the home office staff at Continental Baptist Missions do the work of missions too. It takes the efforts of Sharon, Mary, and Joanne to record and receive financial support received from churches and individuals to properly distribute it to CBM missionaries. It takes the skilled labor of Valerie to communicate accurately and attractively vital news regarding the work of the work and workers of CBM to our constituents. These faithful servants 
are more than worthy of their modest wage that that they are paid. And and to give you a little bit of an idea, CBM is a smaller agency. Uh, Valerie works full time, but Sharon works four days a week, Mary two days a week, and Joanne three days a week. So our staff is a really small, a really small staff for what we are what we are doing. The work of CBM is overseen by two administrators who are not salaried employees of CBM. They do not receive a salary from CBM, but they are instead supported missionaries. Brad Hoff, a veteran CBM church planter, serves as the director of, of church planting. Brad also serves as the administrative director overseeing daily operations in, in the CBM office. And then myself, Dallas Putnam, a veteran, veteran CBM builder, serves as the director of building ministry. Dallas also serves as finance director overseeing the accounting bookkeeping procedures of CBM. The local church doing the work of mission involves basic vital functions being performed by faithful support personnel in addition to frontline missionaries on the field. It's been that way since the foundation of the church. When you look back and see you're going through the book of Acts right now, Pastor had mentioned earlier, and you look back at Titus and you, you look back at these books and you see that what's taking place in missions today is the way it started uh, started from the beginning. Uh, I would ask that you would, that you would pray with us that the Lord of the harvest would send forth laborers into the harvest field. We need missionary builders and missionary church planters with Continental Baptist Missions. I believe that the need for church planting and church revitalization here in North America today is probably greater than it was even in 1942 when the mission began. And when you think of 1942 and beginning an agency, 1942 was probably one of the worst times you could think of, of, of starting an agency. Right at the end of the Great Depression, the World War II, and these men stepped out as pioneers because they knew that the gospel needed to go out across North America, people needed to reach for Christ. Today, we need to continue to pioneer and step out and reach across our country with the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's little pockets of places where there's several churches, but there's still vast areas that do not have a good Bible preaching, Bible teaching church. And far more churches that are dwindling and dying. I recently heard a statistic for a college that said for every Every 35 requests that they have for a pastor, they have one available to be able to send. We need local churches today that are getting people grounded in the word so that they can go out as pastors, so that they can go out as missionaries, so they can go out as church planters and church builders, so that they can be involved in growing others right here within the local church. Please pray with us as we endeavor to partner with some churches that are raising up missionaries for the future. And thank you for your faithful partnership with us uh, through these many years. And as the Lord gives me strength by God's grace, uh, I continue to plan to continue to go as long as he gives me the strength to serve. Uh, the harvest is great and the laborers are few. And as long as I can, I wanna be one of those laborers. Thank you. Now we can say. Okay. I'm, I'm not going to leave you. <laughs> so if you stand with me now, we'll say 703. Nothing is impossible. second verse we'd like to dismiss the children for children's church on that second verse 650. 
And in the early days of the church, there was this incredible explosion of growth. And we've seen that in the first four chapters of the book. They went from 120 people meeting in an upstairs room uh, to all of a sudden now, now there's 3,000. And uh, then the day that uh, Peter and John were arrested, 5,000 men uh, were saved and turned to Jesus Christ in one day. And we see this massive explosion of growth in spite of the pressures of society, in spite of the Jewish Supreme Court declaring that Jesus and talking about Jesus is illegal and all the threats and everything that happened. People were getting saved. People were getting baptized. People were being added to the church every single day. So I asked the question, how can that be? How was the church thriving in a world that wanted to destroy it? Well, last week we uh, began to answer that question. We see that it, it was because they were a praying church. They, they, were, they were praying all the time. The church was confronting all of the threats, the persecution, uh, head on with prayer. And because of their prayers, they were given even more boldness to go out and preach. And clearly we see there in, in that chapter that God is active within the church, even though they were disobeying the Sanhedrin and preaching Jesus Christ. That's the first way they uh, confronted the world was with prayer. The second reason the church was thriving in a society that wanted to kill them was unity. That's what we're going to start talking about this morning. Unity. And, and before we go too far, I haven't even read the verses yet, but I kind of want to lay the groundwork just a little bit. Uh, I think it's important to say that unity does not mean that we have to agree on everything. You hear where I'm going with that? Unity does not mean we have to agree on everything. Uh, one of the lines I saw where it's going to go up on the screen, unity does not equal uniformity. 
Imagine if we came to church and we all looked alike, all dressed alike, we all had the same haircuts. Would we be a church or a cult? Right? There'd, there'd be a fine line right there, right? Unity is, is not when we all look alike. It, it's when we all unite around the message of Jesus Christ. So we, we aren't looking for uniformity at First Baptist Church of North Branch. We are looking for unity. You know, I, I tried to write down a few things that sort of people can, can divide up on. You know, we're not, we're, we're united because we all believe the same thing about schooling for children. Right? There's public school, there's home school, there's Christian school. We're not like all on the same page there. We, we don't unite around a Bible version. King James Version, New King James Version, NIV, ESV, CEV, on and on and on. We aren't united around a dress code where all the men have suits and ties and all the women have a certain length uh, dress or skirt or, or whatever they wear. We aren't united around skin color, political party, we're, we, the only thing we are united around is Jesus Christ. Thank you, Mom. At least my mom's listening this morning. So I, I heard a friend say, uh, uh, and we're going to put this quote up on the screen. He said, when Christians unite around something other than Christ, they create a community around something that would exist even if God didn't. You get that? What that means? So our focus, as 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 a church, is unity. Not where we agree on everything. It's when we agree just on one thing. That is obeying and glorifying our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So when we come together as a church, we only have to agree on one thing, and grace should cover the rest. Let's begin. Reading there in Acts chapter 4, verse 32. It says, Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul, neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own. But they all had all things in common. And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Do you see that? Grace was covering the rest. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of land or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet. And they distributed to each as anyone had need. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. You see, the, the, the church's response to the threats of the world was to first pray, and second, to unite as one, to draw in together and become one. And what I see in these verses is love, and I see sacrifice, and a question that one of the writers asked was, how far would you go to meet someone else's needs? How far would you go? The Bible says this fellow named Barnabas was willing to sell property to meet someone else's needs. What a phenomenal example of unity. One heart, one soul, and, and no one was saying, that is mine. Isn't that one of the first things that babies learn? Yeah. Mine. Often before they say no or dad or mom, it's mine. The early church in the city of Jerusalem had a selflessness that you don't see very often in this world. In fact, the selflessness and the unity that the church had, uh, that Jesus Christ instructs us to have, is so very contrary to this world. However, even though the world does not operate this way, what it does when we have unity is it draws the world to the church. When we love each other, it is a powerful appeal to people. 
And that's as true as it was back then as it still is today. When we are one, when we love each other, the world takes note and they are drawn to it. Sometimes I hear people say, well, I, I don't know how to talk about Jesus. I don't know how to be a witness for Jesus Christ. I don't know what to say. I'm scared. You know, I, don't, I can't debate evolution versus creation. I don't know all these different Bible verses where if they give me this one, when I say this one, I don't know where to go next. I don't know anything about false religions. I've heard people even say, well, pastor, you know, I've disqualified myself. I can't witness, I cannot tell people about Jesus because I've disqualified myself. 27 years ago, I cursed out a little girl on Mackinac Island. I can't talk about Jesus. 38 years ago, uh, when I watched Old Yeller, I didn't cry. And I can't talk about Jesus. No one will listen to me. Okay, you know, I get it, I get it. You're a little shy, you're a little bit scared, maybe a rejection, you're just afraid a little bit. Okay, if you can't talk about Jesus, if you can't speak out about Jesus Christ, if all you did was love each other in this room like Jesus wants us to do, that in and of itself would be a witness. Amen. Tony read it, uh, those words of Jesus Christ a little while ago, John uh, 13, 35. By this, uh, they will know us because of the Bible version we use. Is that what that? No. Now, I bring this up because have you ever been driving down the road and there's a huge church sign and it says the Bible version that they use? It's like they, they know we are Christians by the Bible version we use. I mean, that's a central issue to some people. I, I don't remember if I told this story in, in here, but uh, uh, a church called me one time and they said, uh, you know, we, we want to give you the names of some children that live in your area that, that just moved here from, you know, some other state, North Carolina or something. And, and they said, do, are you, do you use this particular Bible version? I said, uh, I like that particular Bible version, but we're not like tied to it. it that's not on our sign. Yeah. And she said to me on the phone, ah, I guess I can't give you those children's names. Wow. So it's a central issue to some people. Let's look at that verse. It's up on the screen. Um, uh, they will know we are Christians because of the clothes we wear. Is that what the verse says? Is this another one of those areas that sometimes churches really emphasize? Maybe they don't put it on their sign, but I have seen it the other way, not the, not, not the traditional way, but I have seen it on a sign. Uh, we're a casual church. Have you ever seen that? There's a, one church online. Sometimes I listen to the, the pastor's sermons. The church is called Sandals Church. And the pastor wears, you know, uh, kind of like a, a shirt like Matt, a Hawaiian shirt and some shorts and some sandals. And he goes up there and he's really super duper cool. Way cooler than me. They will, they will know we are Christians because we all wear sandals and we're laid back. Or there's some churches that, that say, you know, we, we got to be really conservative. The men have to wear suits and ties and the, the women dresses. No. Look at that verse again. By, by, they will know we are Christians by the music that we play. And the verse doesn't say that either, does it? Is that an issue in churches? Music is it, is it an issue? Class, is there a difference of opinion in music? Yes. Yeah, 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 for sure, right? There, there are churches out there that think they will know we are Christians by the music we play. Here's another one of the stories, I think I've told it before, but uh, Andrea would, can attest to this. Uh, but this, this person uh, said, this pastor, he told me this a few years back, he said, no one will come to your church if you don't play contemporary music. 
So they will know we are Christians because we have a really cool band. Or, you know, the opposite end of that, they will know we are Christians because we hold to traditional music with piano and organs and hymns. No, no, Jesus says, this is the way that they will know you are my disciples if you love one another. So my question is, how well are we doing? You know, it's really easy to get caught up in the ways of the world. And we, we want to develop this brand of church or a style of worship. Yeah, yes, we're Baptist. Yes, we're biblical. Yes, we are theologically conservative. Yes, we are a simple country church. But... We shouldn't be known as the church, oh, they're the church that still has an organ. Oh, they're the church that still has a bus. Or they're, has a, they're a church that still does whatever. Wouldn't it be great if we were known as the church that loves each other in Jesus Christ with their whole heart? I mean, is it possible that loving Jesus and loving each other is our chief identifier in this community? I mean, wouldn't that be a great thing if, if that happened? They're not perfect over there, First Baptist of North Bridge, but they sure do talk about Jesus a lot, and they sure do love each other. Wouldn't it be incredible to have that kind of testimony? Look down there at Acts 4, verse 33. So they are loving each other, one heart, one soul, and they are still on their mission. You see that, verse 33? They're still on their mission. They were still telling people their testimony. So what I want us to see this morning is that there wasn't any time to bicker, argue, gossip, criticize, or get mad at anyone else because they're too busy praying and loving each other and talking about Jesus. And the joy in that church was so thick that people could see it. And they're just coming to Jesus by the thousands. Because of their prayer, because of their love for one another, and because their dedication to preaching the abundant grace of Jesus Christ was upon them all. Class, the church had found the favor of God. The blessings of God were upon them. How many here would like it if somebody said the abundant grace of God was upon First Baptist Church in North Branch? Yes. So the church here in the book of Acts is truly a gospel-centered community. They are a true community. And no one had any needs because if you had a need, someone would meet it. So people are selling things. People are giving money to the church. It is, it's this incredible generosity. It's generosity at its finest. The church is living together and they are loving each other. You say, well, pastor, how can we do that? <laughs> Let's break down this text. Let's try to simplify it a little bit. Number one is uh, by friendship. The first way to really have this community is by friendship. Verse 32. Some of those who believed were of one heart and one mind. Does it say some? It says mul the multitude. So all of them. All of them were of one heart and one mind. There is genuine friendship. This... This, a uh, good way to say it would be that the believers there in the church truly cared about each other. They are clinging tightly to the community of believers and they are letting go of their love for things of the world. This must have been difficult to do because at this point, they are essentially a mega church. Have you ever thought about that? They're a mega church. 5,000 men are saved in one day. I, I would assume some women and some children were saved. I mean, this, this church could be over 20,000 people, yet they still care about what's going on in each other's lives. 
You know, they say when your church becomes a mega church that you have to really work hard to create fellowship times and they, they encourage small groups and, and you have to be aware of group dynamics because once you get so big, you don't really know people there anymore. So you got to get involved and push these fellowship groups and, and ministry groups. You know, big churches have to constantly do that. Well, I don't know if you've ever noticed how many people come here to our church on Sunday mornings, but I think you can look around and quickly confirm that we're not a mega church. Can you see, can you agree with that? We're not a we're not a mega church by any stretch of the imagination. So that means we don't have to worry a lot about those different group dynamics that you have to be concerned about when your, your, your church gets big. That means that our friendships here should be outstanding. We don't have a mega church. I mean, there's, there's really no excuse for you not to have friends and building friendships in this room. A while back, I was encouraging someone in here uh, to develop more friends, and I dropped some names. I said, get to know Albert, get to know Lyle, Tony, Nathan. And the person said to me, I, I care about others, but it seems awkward to just show up and say, hi, I'm here to spend time with you. Maybe if that person was thinking that, I am sure other people from church were thinking that. And folks, what I'm, what I'm here to say as we read Acts chapter 4 is we have to get beyond thoughts like that. We have to build friends within this community, within this church. That same individual asked me a question and I want us to sincerely consider it this morning. They said, are we the body of Christ or are we just neighbors who care about each other a little more than what the world does? Are we expected as a church by Jesus Christ to just rise up a little bit above the world? Like we're just one notch better than the world in the way that we love each other. Or are we called to go way beyond that? I mean, we are called in this verse to be one heart and one soul. How are we doing in that? How are we doing in the friendship? One more point, we're almost done. Verse 32 through 35. They also were just in incredible examples in generosity. First in friendship, secondly in generosity. We see that they were sharing. And, and because of their generosity, there was no needy persons among them. Then we see in verse 36, there was a fellow named Joseph, a Levite. Now, a lot of the commentators really went off here on, on the Levite. Levites, according to the first five books of the Old Testament, were not supposed to own property. Yet, uh, whatever, for whatever reason, he owns land and he sells it and he gives the money to the church. And he is such an encouragement to the church that they changed his name to Barnabas. And can you imagine coming to church? You know, we renamed Dallas's name to, you know, uh, Mr. Builder or something like that. Bob the Builder, you know, not Dallas Putnam anymore. It's, it's Bob the Builder. And, and we have this big ceremony at church and we thank him. And, you know, the deacons lay hands on him and we're now changing your name. That we wouldn't do things like that. But this was such a big deal and the generosity that they renamed. Joseph to Barnabas. The church family was saying, I see a need, I meet a need. Now, this is so very important to review because I think the devil is always pushing disunity in the church. Satan knows what Jesus said in John 13, 35. Satan knows that our love for each other is the greatest draw to Jesus Christ. So what do you think Satan's going to do? 
He's going to attack our unity. I'm sure we've heard the different horror stories over the years about uh, church fights. You know, a church breaks up because of the, the carpet color. You kidding me? They break up over these ridiculous things. And then a whole bunch of testimonies are ruined. And most importantly, the cause of Christ is harmed because of disunity. So folks, this morning, and I'm almost done, I'm going to ask you to pray for the unity of our church. When you, when you go to pray at night, or maybe you pray on your way to work in the car in the morning, maybe you pray at some other time, pray for the unity in this church. Pray for unity in the leadership. You know, we have deacons meetings. We need unity in that group. We have business meetings here at least every quarter. We need to pray for unity in the membership. When we come together on Sunday mornings or Sunday nights or Sunday school or whenever we get together, we need to pray for unity because, uh, because the devil and the demons are attacking that unity. They'll even use the world to attack our unity. They'll do whatever they can to try to break us up. Which brings us back to our opening question. How does the church thrive in a world that wants to kill? By knowing our identity. Yes, we are saved by grace through faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, and by understanding our mission of reaching the lost world. You know, it's frustrating because sometimes I think that there's a lot of Christians out there that think our mission is to simply exist. But we're holding the line and we're hanging in there. Our mission is just to live another day. When we look in the book of Acts, I, I don't think our mission is just to barely scrape by and, and simply hang on. Our mission is to be witnesses. And Jesus Christ says that we have the power in us to do that. So I see in this text that the church thrives uh, when we are praying and when we have unity in the body. Let's pray. Father God, what an incredible, uh, powerful picture that we see here in the book of Acts. Lord, it's history, ancient history. And the temptation is for us to read these passages and just to uh, memorize them or file them in our brains as simply facts. Yes, Peter and John were arrested. Yes, the Sanhedrin made, made Christianity illegal. Yes, they, you know, Barnabas sold a piece of property. You know, Lord, the temptation is for, just to, for us to file these things away, but help us to move beyond just the, the facts of history and see the application and see what you want us to do in particular in our church here. Lord, I see a massive lesson about unity. Father, help us to see this, understand it, and to try our best to live it out. Unity. Lord, we need it. We need it because the world is attacking us, because the, there's sort of pushing in on us and sort of aligning everything. Lord, our friends in, in Nigeria need unity to be able to stand up against the level of persecution that they're facing. The Dallas and, and, and building churches, they need unity in their ministry. All these areas, Lord, we need that unity. We know that only happens when we all unite because of Jesus Christ, your one and only perfect Son. Father, I pray even for our VBS this week that the, the leadership and the teens would just become one accord, one soul and one mind with the mission that you've given them. 
Father, these requests are a tall order, but we know that you are a God that can do the impossible. So we ask you by faith in your son's holy and precious name. Amen. Stand and turn to 472. this morning we are having lunch so as soon as we all get in there and settle down and we all know the food's ready uh, someone will say a prayer and that will be uh, the, the cue uh, to go get in line and get some food so uh, I'm just really glad you're here today and, and hopefully we see you next door we'll see ya